Ah, 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 ah. Oh, you just got a flash of him. Now he's hiding. He's double back. Back's back. Isn't that awesome? That was, uh, Cameron found that. It's the big issue. The latest version of the big issue. Isn't that awesome? What's that? Yeah, scared you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw, um, on uh, the other night, I had a big, boring task to do that took an enormous amount of time. And so while I was doing it, I put on um, Van Helsing. Has anyone seen that film? Yeah. I was, yeah, it's terrible. I was so disappointed. I was, did you like it? It just, oh, yeah, it's like that excellent Lego um, rubber band gun, but not as good. Yeah. No, it's, oh, what a lame, lame, lame show. And it's so unlike the normal sterling work we're used to from Hugh Jackman. Well, okay. Clicks, thoughts. I want to revise. What did we talk about last lecture? Last lecture. Shh, 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 shh. Okay, we're going to start now. Last lecture, we talked um, uh, about teamwork. And what did we say about teamwork? One. It, it always shh, goes shh. wrong. It always goes wrong. I didn't say that, but we know that. <laughs> we know that. Suddenly it always goes wrong. But that's not just teamwork. That's insert X. What do we know about interesting thing X that's very important? What do we know about love? What do we know about the economy? What do we know about our plans for the future? What do we know about anything that's important? Yeah, things always go wrong. The trick in life is when things go wrong that we don't go to pieces, that we handle it gracefully. And now, uh, so what I wanted to say about teamwork was, what I did say about teamwork was one, is not about blame. You could play the blame game because when things go wrong, sometimes it's tempting to blame other people. But we're engineers and scientists, so we're not interested in allocating blame. That's politicians and lawyers that do that. What are we interested in? Fixing things, solving problems, finding out, moving forward. So we're not interested in who stuffed up, except insofar as it gives us important information about the act of stuffing up. We're interested in how to make sure we don't stuff up again. So one is it's not about blame, it's about solving the problem and moving forward. Point number two is, um, point number... Two. two. That's point number one. Point number two <laughs> is... Uh, <laughs> um, I'm so excited by that, I've forgotten point number two. But point number three is, uh, oh no, it's joint point number two. What do you think point number two was? What's another important thing about group work? It's not about blame. Yeah, it's about communication. Being prepared for things to go wrong. You've got to be prepared for things to go wrong. When things go wrong, you've got to somehow have built plans in and things like that for dealing with it. I think teamwork is a lot like marriage. And I say this as a person that has extensive experience in marriage. I have been married. And I still am married. <laughs> so, that's, that's credit to my wife. Now, um, one thing I learned early on in marriage, and you probably are learning in your own relationships if, if you're having relationships now, and let me encourage you to have relationships now. It's very, very important to do that. Um, and get married in the lectures if you want. That's fine. <laughs> uh, what I learned was very early on that my wife and I both felt in any situation that we had done 75% of the work and the other person had done 25%. So in any given scenario, I would be thinking, well, I did most of this and she did 25. And she would be thinking, well, I did most of this and he did 25. Largely because we have different value functions. Like she just did 25% of the work and she spent the rest of the time just tidying the house. <laughs> and she'll say, Gee, I, Richard only did 25% of the work and he spent the rest of the time sorting the DVDs into alphabetical order. <laughs> Each of us not appreciating the vital and important work that the other one does. We have different um, value, utility functions. So we learned pretty early on that uh, a successful marriage is not about accounting. You can't add things up and weigh them because you'll always feel you're doing more than half. In fact, we have a theory now that if it feels like we're doing exactly half, we're probably not pulling, putting in hard enough. So, uh, so I think marriage is uh, like that, and group work is like that too. You just put in as much as you can, and you just make it work. And when it doesn't work, you smile and you move on. You don't get all tense. Because if you get tense and angry and start blaming, it actually causes destructive problems into the future. 
as you probably know. So that's what I wanted to say about Tim. Oh, I remember point one about teamwork, <laughs> <laughs> which was this. It was related to the we're bad at it. It's we're particularly bad at it because not only are human beings bad at it, but we're like engineers and geeks and not so good at interpersonal communication stuff. And we quite like to control everything ourselves. We like what you call control freaks. I'm not, maybe not speaking for all of you. But we like controlling things and being in charge of things and everything being exactly like we like it. It has to be like that. It's not like that. And so, so we're particularly bad at group work, which involves compromise and communication and compassion and understanding and not always winning and giving in and all that sort of stuff. So point number two about group work is um, that I think it's something we need to work on because we want to be balanced people. So you are probably really good at computing and analytical stuff, and you're probably really weak at um, group work, and you could solve that problem by saying, the rest of my life will just be computing and never involve interacting with other human beings again, and I will like sidestep the problem. But it's just very hard to arrange a life like that. So I think you will have to make group work work. So the trick is, if you're not good at something, well, rejoice and then concentrate on that thing you're not good at. It's regarded as a, an exciting challenge. In the same way that I make myself listen to John Laws on the radio every now and then. I think you should force yourself to do things you're not good at or don't like, just in case they turn out to be really good because you've got some preconceived notion that's wrong. Like I tell my girls with their broccoli. I'm not going to like that. Just try it and see, I say. Maybe you will like it. Cruelly. <laughs> okay, so that's my thought about group work. We're weak at it, but we should work at it rather than complain about it, and we should try and make it work and better. And the last thing I guess I wanted to say about group work, which was, what have we done? One, two, three, four. Point number four about group work is, gee, I'm forgetting everything today. Point number four about group work is, I had a little song that helped me remind it. But I've forgotten the song now. <laughs> Oh, yes, yes, that's right, the most important thing. That um, the arguments I gave yesterday for thinking the group work was important and thinking it's worth your effort to try and improve your group work skills were that you, your employees are going to want you to do it. But I realized when I went home that's a pretty lame argument because who cares what your employees want and things like that. A more compelling argument is that when group work works, it, it, it's like marriage. It's the most amazing thing. You, you probably haven't experienced it working, so you don't know how good it is. But when group work's working fantastically, you are just like, it's like you're skiing or you're flying or something. You've got multiple people working on one project, ideas bouncing around everywhere, and together your parts exceed you individually. And you can do, when, you, when group work works, it is just so amazing. It's unbelievable. It's Captain Planet. It's just fantastic. Okay, so that's what I want to say about group work. Now, I, I want to return to talking about heaps. We talked about heaps, and I thought, let's do a heap on the board. Do you remember yesterday I said, or whenever it was, last lecture, Tuesday, I said, shh, 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 shh. guys, guys. I said that we can always make the heap fit into an array by saying the child of any element i, the two children of i, will be stored where? At 2i and 2i plus 1. And that's supposing we store the root in node number 1. So we'll leave an unused element here. You could actually um, change the maths and move the root down one. Though make sure you're not doing more mathematical operations then, because it would be a pain to do an extra addition or subtraction on every um, heap access, just to save yourself one memory location. Probably better to uh, leave it empty if that was the case. So check that out. So yeah, the two children of I stored at 2i and 2i plus 1. And I told you that that will always work. How could that fail? What, in what ways could that fail? Well, I mean, what I'm saying is that we can implicitly store the tree data structure in the array. It, it, might, it would fail if, say, for example, there were two elements, that some, that some, there was somehow some sort of overlap, so two elements land, like the squ custody fight. <laughs> two different elements believing they're their children. Or it would be bad if, oh, gaps, is that what you meant? It would be bad if adjacent elements maybe, uh, let me draw that larger, 
we've got node i, and then we've got node i, i plus 1. It would be bad if he went there and there, and then he went, what, there and there, and there was no one landing, and the gap started to form. That would all be bad. So just looking at it, it probably looks like it could work. But maybe when I made that claim that it always worked, you should have been more skeptical and tested it out. Which reminds me, there was an interesting news article, you may have read about it, about um, they did surveys of people in capital cities and they discovered that people in Melbourne were quite skeptical and people in Sydney were very gullible. Did everyone hear that survey? Yes, and, and it's a load of crap because it was completely fake. So the amusing thing was that the media in Melbourne reported this story that this scientific survey had proved that Melbourne people were not gullible and Sydney people were. And the Melbourne media went to town going on about how not gullible they were and da 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 It is very, very funny. So we've all got to be sceptical and not just believe things or you'll spend your life singing happy birthday to people whose birthday it isn't and things like that. So, so what you've got to do shh, shh, is when I make some sort of claim like this always works, I'd like you to check it. Now how could you check it? Let's suppose we've got some sort of a tree, a binary tree that's going to have the heat property. Let's make it complete. How could you check that? Oh, missing one. Point it back to the tree. Yes, we've got to relate this to the tree in some way and show that the property holds. One way I was thinking, well, first of all, let's just check there's enough space for it to fit into an array like that. One thing to notice is, if you've got a big enormous box, say of size 2 to the n, and you subtract off the last row, which will contain, say, 2 to the n, if we, if we take half of that, let's just halve that, and that's going to be 2 to the n minus 1, of course. And then we, we I don't know, how do we halve it? We fill it in with something. We fill it up with, what's something you could fill a space with? With more space? <laughs> we fill it with different space. Dark space. And then we take some more space, and then we take what's left and we fill half of that in. That's 2 to the n minus 2. And then we take what's left and we fill that in. That's 2 to the n minus 3. Can you see we can keep doing this forever, and we're never going to exceed 2 to the n? The sum of all the powers of 2 less than 2 to the n are all going to fit in this box. Because every time we add another one, we're just halving what's left. In fact, what's going to be left at the very end is we're going we're to be filling in a, a, a thing of size 2, and then we're going to fill in a thing of size 1, and we're going to, oh, I'll put it in here, and then we're going to have one left over. Can you see that? So in fact, it turns out the sum of 2 to the i uh, from uh, 0 to uh, n equals uh, 2 to the n minus, 2 to the n plus 1, Minus one. We've always got one left over if we add them all up. So, using um, that argument and noticing that the number of elements in each row doubles each time will give you an indication that an array of size, if your tree uh, in the, uh, contains two to the n elements, uh, no, what will that convince you? That will convince you that, well, what that will convince you is that the first node here will be labelled 1, if we're starting from 1, and the next node here will be labelled 2, and that'll be 3, and the next node here will be labelled 4. And that should sort of convince you that going down this arm of the tree, you're going to have just powers of 2. Does that convince you of that? Because pick any given spot here, this number is one more then the sum of all these rows, clearly, because we're labelling them all, we're putting all numbers on them, and this number will be one more than the last number, and the last number here will be the sum of all the rows. And the sum of all the rows is 2 to the n minus uh, 2 to the 0, 2 to the 1, 2 to the 2, 2 to the 3. And we know adding all the powers of 2 together will give us 1 less than 2 to the next power. Yeah, yeah, so adding 2 to the 1 plus 2 to the 2 plus 2 to the 3 is 1 less than 2 to the 4. So the next guy down here will be the next power of 2. So that tells us going down here are powers of 2, and then I guess we could work out that a given element, a given child in here, which is a no k along, we could work out where in the row below its children will have to be and express that in terms of uh, a k and 2 to the n. And then we could just show that doubling this actually gave that expression. 
Did I explain that very clearly? I don't think I did. Suppose this element here was uh, arbitrarily, we don't know how far back the tree goes. Suppose this is 2 to the k, this guy, and we're interested in this random element here, which is some number of children in. Let's call that 2 to the k plus a. This guy here is 2 to the k plus a. 2 to the k plus a means there's, because that's 2 to the k, that means there's a nodes to the left of it. That means on the row below there'll be if they're all getting, each of those nodes is getting two children, there'll be 2a coming in. So, and the index of this next guy down here will be 2 to the k plus 1. So our children should be 2 to the k plus 1 plus, um, we're going in, uh, so uh, we, want two to the, we want 2a coming in from there, but we start counting um, at 0, like we start counting at 2 to the k plus 1, so that's 2 to the k plus 1. 2 to the k plus 1 plus 1, 2 to the k plus 1 plus 2, 2 to the k plus 1 plus 2, da -da -da -da, all the way up to 2 to the k plus 1 plus 2a minus 1 is that one. So our next one here will be that plus 1. So one child will be 2 to the k plus 1 plus 2a, and the other child will be next to that. That's 2 to the k plus 1 plus 2a plus 1. And then we just have to notice, oh, good grief, that's exactly what we wanted, which is... 2 to the k plus a times 2 plus 0 or 1 for either child. So the expression for this position and the expression for that position are in fact exactly related as we expect. So we could do some sort of proof like that. No, we don't. All, I, I can't do a proof for every little thing like that that we see in the lectures. But I sort of want you to be sceptical and check things. You, you, there's not enough time in your life to check everything, but don't fall in the human habit of checking nothing, just believing everything. That's, that's the worst thing to do. So let's now... Um, look at how we can insert something into a heap. We looked at how a heap was structured, but I didn't give you the insert and delete operations. Someone remind me what the heap properties were. What are they? To be... You must be greater than... You must be greater than your parents. Or equal to your parents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's put the smallest one on the top. <laughs> that sort of covers the whole range, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. But the same, the same condition has to apply over the whole tree. So let's say we're going to uh, have a heap like this. Uh, I'll just... I'll put the positions as circles. Let's just stick some numbers in. Okay, we'll put the smallest one at the top. Maybe that's um, uh, 10. And his children are... Give me some answers. Give me some numbers. People over here. Anyone over here that doesn't know the answer to this question, put up your hand. What's a legal value that could go here? Anyone that doesn't know the answer? Oh, there's a 10 at the top. And it's a, a min heap binary tree. Uh, I mean, it's a binary heap with the minimums at the top. So what value could go here? Any legal value? What's that? 10? 10? Again? Yep, 10's a legal value that could go there. What's a legal value that could go here? 10. <laughs> it's good that you gave me another 10 because there's nothing worse than being two 10s. <laughs> Oh, I'm happy now. Okay, so, um, I don't know, that could be 13. That could be 11, 17, 16. Can this be 12? No, it can't because it's parents 13. So what's the smallest it can be? Uh, it could be 13. Let's make it 14. Uh, and uh, this is going to be bigger than that. This could be 12. Uh, this could be 18. This could be 16. No, it can't be 16. I meant 600. <laughs> this can be 20. Uh, this could be, uh, what, 19. This could be uh, uh, 17. Oh, sorry, 27. What's that? 9,001. 9,301. 1,337. <laughs> <laughs> That's very cool. Okay. Now, shh, 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 shh,
There's our heap. It's not entirely complete, is it? Because I left one little gap at the end, but that's okay. We can leave gaps at the end um, uh, on our heaps. As long as they're all jammed over on that far side, we're happy. And we really like that property because remember it means it sits compactly in an array. And all I need to remember is the position of the very last element or the very first hole. And that tells me the entire structure. I don't need the pointers to create the tree structure. Now, um, there it is. It's sitting there. It's beautiful. We can access it. You can look things up. I can say, um, this will be stored at index 1, this will be index 2, index 3, index 4, index 5, index 6, index 7, index 8, 9, 10. Look at these powers of 2. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. And I could say to you, oh, uh, what's the value of the child of node 6? Well, what's the address of the child of node 6 in the array up here? And you could straight away tell me the children are stored at 12 and 13. Yep, double six, add one. Shh, 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 shh. So we can do queries on it, absolutely fine. But of course, a heap is useful if we want to modify it. Well, one of the uses of it is we want to modify it. How could we add to the heap? How could we subtract from the heap? Let's look at adding to the heap. How could you add, suppose, what number might you want to add to the heap? 1,337. <laughs> Stop that. <laughs> oh, but we'll add those digits together. And that gives us 14. And we add those digits together. And that gives us 5. And we add those digits together. And that gives us 5. OK. Um, so we're going to insert 5. That's, that's, he's going to go all the way to the top, isn't he? That's not so interesting. Um, let's pick a number in the middle. 6. <laughs> let's pick 11. All right, we're going to insert 11. How can we do it? I mean, you know how to do it on the board. You just rub things out and draw it somewhere. But how could you do it on a computer where you've got to write it in a thing and you'll have to compare values and swap them around? And at the end of this insertion operation, we want the entire array to still satisfy the heap property. Well, where does it have to go? Well, where do the elements have to go? There has to be an element that goes here. Is it clear? We want the thing to be complete, a completely filled in tree uh, with only holes over here. So some element has to go here. So let's start by just putting 11 here. Now notice the whole tree is, the whole thing, the whole structure is a heap and satisfies the heap property, except the last one doesn't. So what do we need to do? We compare it with its parent. Shh, shh, shh. That's why they're called comparants. Uh, and if, <laughs> oh, you started it with the two tans. Uh, um, if it's smaller than its parent, what do we have to do? Swap. Now, is that, is that OK to move the parent down? Is that going to muck things up? No, it's not. It depends on the other child, maybe. No, it doesn't depend on the other child. How could it depend on the other child? This is smaller than the parent, and we know the parent has to be smaller than the other child. So by transitivity, this has to be smaller than or equal to the other child. So we can swap them around. In this case, that's not very hard. Just have to move two matchsticks. Now. Now, the other child can't be smaller. Convince yourself of this fact. So now we're here. Now, have we actually solved the problem at all? No. no. What do we have to do again? Compare with the parent. Is it smaller than the parent? Yes. Yep. So we have to swap it with the parent. Yeah. Now we compare with the parent. We're bigger than or equal to the parent. So we're happy. We terminate. And we've created a new heap. We've inserted it into the thing. So. What's the very worst thing that could happen when you're inserting? It has to go to the top, which would be log n steps. Log n rounds it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So an insert operation is of cost log n. That's pretty cool. How could you build a heap from scratch? From scratch, from nothing. You've got a, a list of elements, and I tell you, please arrange these to make them into a legal heap. OK. We could put it into a tree and then just apply the swapping function to everything till it calms down. Could, uh, can we? Uh, yes, that would work. That would work. Um, a more systematic. Oh, that would work. 
So do the elements, and then you have your heap represented. I'll sort all the elements, and then you have the heap. Yeah, but how much work is it to sort all the elements? And log n. Uh, so you're saying sort all of the elements and put them in the heap. If you sort them, that's a heap. No, it's not. Is that a heap? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's going to be n log n. It's going to turn out we can create a heap in order n steps rather than n log n steps. So yeah, you could, you could sort it entirely, but that's a bit more work than you need to do. But yeah, okay, you're right, you could sort it, as Jarrah points out, with the smaller numbers up here, parents are going to be at the smaller end, which is where we expect. <laughs> you sort it with heaps of what? <laughs> um, you could do it this way. Oh, yeah. Ah, okay. Cameron's got a, a good suggestion, which is... What about we start with an empty heap and we just recursively insert elements into the heap? Take the new element, insert, like the opposite of insertion sort. We call it insertion heap or something. Just insert them in one at a time. Um, using the heap uh, operation. Yep, yep, that would work. That would work. That, um, how, yeah, is that going to be n or n log n? I have a funny feeling, well, yeah, that means it's not n, yeah. I have a funny feeling that's still going to be n log n, though I also have a funny feeling that it's a better n log n in terms of the constants being smaller than the sort. But we're going to try it out in the lab next week. Next week we're going to try both ways of building a heap, see how they go. Okay, so... The interesting thing uh, about this other method... Oh, well, let's look at how the other method would work. What you'd do is you'd have an array of numbers. Let's suppose there's no one in the first position and we're just going to, we're wasting our first position. Or let's suppose our array, we're in some new language, not C, um, uppercase C perhaps, where um, arrays start from one. So we've got all our data here. And all we do is we just say, oh, well, let's pretend initially we've got our first element is a heap and everyone else here is just rubbish. Because one element by itself will always be a heap. And you say, all right, I'm going to apply the heap insert algorithm for this part of the array. So I'm going to insert this guy into the heap. And after that operation, you'll have built a heap here. And then you say, all right, now I'm going to insert the next guy into the heap. And then I'm going to insert the next guy here into the heap. And you just keep inserting one at a time. By the way, inserting means what do you have to do to insert? Literally, we said down here, to insert, you have to compare with your parent. So if you're um, up to here and you're about to insert, you're looking at cell number 7 and it happens to contain 43, what are you going to do? You're going to compare that with cell number 3. That's right. You're going to halve it and round down because 3 double plus 1 is 7, so 3 is apparent. So uh, that actually wasn't 7. <laughs> There's dot, dot, dot here. Um, so you're going to compare that with that. And if it's... Uh, uh, bigger than or equal to, you're going to leave it, and if it's smaller than, you're going to swap them. And then, you're going to repeat that operation for three. You're going to halve, what's the three? Half, what's the parent of three? One. one. Yep, halve it and round down. So, uh, you're going to compare three with one and possibly swap. So, it's going to take at most two swaps to sort this out. And, and Jarrah, can you see that to sort it, oh, I was going to say it's clearly going to involve more than two swaps. The, the, number, of, the number of swaps here is really low. It's really quite nice. It's still going to be n log n, but it'll be a smaller constant. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. It's, it's, you can't get that yeah. smaller n log n. Oh, no, you can for a heap, just not using this algorithm. The algorithm we look at next is better than n log n. Yeah. Yes? <laughs> What's the algorithm called? It's called the other algorithm. Normally, it's called heapify. <laughs> Named after Uriah Heap, <laughs> who, uh, a very famous algorist. Um, okay, shh, 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 shh. so this is a very nice way of inserting, and it's very simple. It relies on the fact that everything to the left of the element we're inserting is already a heap and already satisfies the heap property. This is called an invariant. It's a very nice way of creating it. Other than, rather than just the initial idea of get, getting everything and inserting like crazy till it all works, we start. We just in, gradually increase the size of the array that satisfies the heap property by one each time. Um, 
so what we do is we, what we have just done then is we've come up with an operation which, assuming the first part of the array satisfies the heat property, we show how to make the whole of the array plus one more element satisfy the heat property. And that statement that everything to the left of me satisfies the heat property is called an invariant. And it's a very nice way of proving programs are correct or analyzing programs is when you loop and do something over and over again, it's very nice if you can show that there's some sort of invariant, some condition that's true for every iteration of the loop. And if you pick your invariant right, then when the loop terminates, you're guaranteed that the, the property you desire uh, will hold. For example, um, what's a, a bubble sort? Uh, how do, oh, tell me, the, what's the invariant for bubble sort? That the last thing is always um, in the last, it's always in order. So bubble sort works that, um, uh, all right, okay, the invariant we're looking at here is, the, uh, we're looking at the loop, and in each loop, uh, in each pass, we've got a, uh, so we've got something called a pass. And in a pass, we bubble all the way along. And we have a loop that does pass after pass after pass after pass, and we're going to have to do n passes. And the invariant applies to this outer loop here, that after any pass, after the kth pass, the first uh, k elements uh, the first k plus one elements, no, no, after the kth plus, the first k elements are sorted. Now to prove that, you've just got to show that if it held for the smaller case, for the k minus one pass, then adding one more pass just changes it one bit more and makes it the first k, uh, if previously k minus one elements were sorted, after one more pass, k elements are sorted. And that proof is not such a big and scary proof. If you've got an, an array where everything's nearly sorted, you've just got to show that this pass is going to put the next one in. And intuitively, that's what you do when you look at bubble sort, I guess. You convince yourself that that will happen. The nice thing about this invariant is that we know after doing n loops, all n elements will be sorted. So this is a very nice way of doing proof when you have loops. You have some invariant, and you just show the invariant is preserved by the loop, and then the loop eventually terminating uh, taken together with the invariant being true at all times normally logically implies what you're trying to improve. So that's a very nice way of proving loops. The reason I'm taking a mild diversion and, and just mentioning invariants, not that we do any program proofs for the first two years, but as you get to more senior years, sometimes you have to prove that your programs are correct, like with maths and logic. Uh, can you think of a program where it might be valid to prove that it's correct? Who might ever want to prove their program was correct? The NICTA thing? Yeah, uh, maybe we'll uh, come to that in a second. Okay. The airline industry. The airline industry. What would they want to prove is correct? That their autopilots are not going to crash. That the autopilot, yeah. That um, there might be some set of conditions. Uh, it's never possible to, um, <laughs> never possible for an Airbus to crash. <laughs> That's probably too bold a claim. Though I don't believe any ever have crashed, have they? Um, it's never possible <laughs> for that Yes, that's right. A smaller thing is something like, it's never possible um, for the um, landing gear to be down when something else is happening. Or on a submarine, it's never possible to be diving with the door open. We talked about that the other day. You might want to have some property like that, and you've got a complex system that looks after both the diving and the door being open, and you don't want to just trust to luck, or I've done a whole lot of testing and it never seems to happen that we dive with the door open. Sometimes you actually want to prove it's impossible to dive with the door open. Uh, in the old days, before computers, how did we deal with problems like that, by the way? If you wanted to have it that you could never dive with the door open, how could people solve an engineering problem? That's just a problem. Checklist, so just have someone that goes around checking things? Yeah, now, that seems to involve humans, and that's what we call an active control system. Like, so someone has to remember to check it, and if they forget, we're doomed. I'll just pick someone that hasn't said anything yet. Yep. You just have like some sort of physical like lever, so it's actually impossible. Have a physical device that actually stops it being possible to dive with the door. That's called a mechanical interlock or something like that. Normally, um, physical devices like that are really wonderful because you just can't break them. There's just they use the laws of physics to stop things going wrong, and the interlock, of course, can always break, like uh, on a gun. Uh, the safety catch can fail, and if people rely on the safety catch, it can actually give you a false sense of security. But if you have a, a properly built um, mechanical interlock, then that can give you security. Uh, interestingly, when later on you'll look at the Therac 25. Oh, no. no? That was what I was about to say. Oh, you're about to say the Therac 25? What were you going to say? 
I was going to say you shouldn't rely on it because the Derek 24 had yes. the mechanical talks, but the Derek 25 didn't. So yes. On it. Yes, that's right. The Therac 24, um, the, the early Theracs were more mechanical, and as they developed, they became, Therax is a huge therapeutic radiation machine, which if you sit in, and it's entirely computer controlled, it's like an Airbus. It's built by the Airbus company, it's fantastic. The pilot has actually no control over the wings at all. A computer does it all. So it's much safer, because computers never go wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, so it's like, it's, the Therac is like the Airbus of the, well it's not just Airbus, everyone does it now, fly by wire, but um, the Therac machine is like, enormous machine capable of putting out life destroying radiation. People sitting under the machine to have photos taken of them. But don't worry, because it's controlled by a computer. <laughs> and the early Theracs had mechanical interlocks in place so that when someone was lying in the machine it wasn't possible to have lethal doses of radiation pour out of the machine for some mechanical reason. And later on they decided to take that out and put in software interlocks which were just as good, in fact even better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what they needed to do was prove that it was correct. And had they tried to do that they would have failed because it wasn't and all these terrible, terrible things happened from the Therac 25 that you'll learn about later on. Yes? If you put, well, if you put I think there's X tab tab something in, in the keyboard, that instant that was the, that was the magic key. <laughs> If you put X tab tab into the keyboard for some reason, that was like a little uh, Easter egg left by the game designers, <laughs> then you lethally radiated the person that was in there. So if the cat was running over the keyboard while someone was lying in there or something. It's funny, X tab tab was my password for years because of that. But uh, <laughs> I've permuted it now so you'll never ever, knowing that information won't help you. So yeah, so basically, um, did you, does anyone recall seeing recently any sort of mechanical interlock device designed to achieve a protocol um, success, not relying on a computer program? Padlock? Padlock, uh, even uh, same film, but a different interlock. Uh, there was a film, not everyone, saw, did everyone see that film yesterday? Did I show everyone? No, no? Yeah, yeah, there was, when they wanted to launch, one of the protocols is it requires two people to launch. You could have some elaborate software that checked two people were at their keyboards and launching and things, but no, it's safer and the military do this. They had a mechanical system making it impossible to launch unless two people were there. How did they do it? The keys were too far apart and both had to be turned simultaneously. So unless you have a hook, which I always take with me, <laughs> uh, then you can't do it. In fact, I remember seeing the Hunt for Red October or something like that. They had a similar system like that but I think it just needed two keys. I think they were near each other. They didn't have to both be physically turned. So the weakness of that system is, what's to stop a rogue person launching a missile? Normally you have dual control. You have two people, needs two people to consent, but actually you just needed to have two keys. How could you have two keys without two people? <laughs> you could kill the other person and take their key. So that's a, a little security flaw. But the, uh, the turning thing with them too far apart, that's not gonna work. Okay. So yeah, so um, we are just skeptical for, uh, for safety reasons in lots of things and we try and design things to force them to be safe. But when we have computers involved, we all know it's very hard. The, the amount of complexity that hides inside, hides inside the computer is mind boggling. We know how hard it is to deal with that complexity. We know no matter how confident we are we write, we'll usually be wrong. So if you want to have a system that does something really important like control a Therac or um, uh, you know, operate my washing machine or something that just can't go wrong, then it's often worth investing vast amounts of money to prove that it's correct. And mathematicians use logic and theorem provers and so on to go through proving, doing logical proofs. And whenever they get to a loop, they'll prove it using an invariant. They'll set up some invariant for the loop, they'll prove that every pass through the loop preserves the invariant at the end of the loop, and then they'll show that that invariant plus the progression quality of the loop, the exit conditions of the loop, implies that what they want. And Cameron, you were talking about the NICTA work. I can't quite remember what Yeah, NICTA are verifying the kernel. They've got a kernel they've made, the L4 kernel. And they have successfully verified it with a computer proof, so now you've got to verify the computer proof. But, <laughs> but you know, so they're trying to prove it to have a provable operating system that's provably correct and secure so that it can be used in military applications and secure applications and so on. Uh, and I should say that there have been many times in the history of computing where people have proved things to be correct, like the Bell La Padua security model, only to find later on that the assumptions were wrong or something like that. So you, you still can't completely rely on a proof, but gee, it's, it's helping you. It's giving you more confidence. All right, now, so um, uh, that all was arising out of what? Skepticism proofs. Uh, we were looking at the... Uh, yeah, we were looking at... We inserted something into the heap. How can we delete something from a heap? Suppose I wanted to... You could get it down to the bottom and then get rid of it? 
Um, how do I get it to the bottom? I could change its value and, yeah, that's a really clever idea. I could change its value and then ripple it down. Yeah, 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 yeah. I could make it, let's just say for now, we'll start with this and we'll convert this into the thing. I could make it the biggest number you can have, like one million. <laughs> um, so we make it really big and now I've got something in the wrong place. How am I going to fix it up? It has to go down. Now, going up was easy, but going down is a bit harder. What's hard about going down here? Uh, the children at the start have to be... Uh... Yeah, you only have one parent, but you have two children. So I'm going to have to do two comparisons. I'm going to have to compare with both children. Because which child can it exchange with? The smallest child. It's got to exchange with the smallest child. Because when this child's at the top, the child has to be smaller than its sibling. Yeah, for the loop thing to... So we're going to have to do one comparison to work out who's smaller. Who's smaller here? 10, and then we're going to um, check to see if I'm bigger or smaller than 10. Oh, actually, I know I'm just going to go down, don't I? I don't have to do that comparison because I'm just going down, down, down. So I just have to do one comparison and a swap. And then one comparison and a swap. Oh, going down here again, it's easy. And then one comparison. Oh, <laughs> I see. I tried to do it randomly, and see the lack of entropy. I've actually always started with the small. Yeah, the, yeah, now of course I don't actually need to, let's just move it down to the bottom before we say that, but that's exactly, I've forgotten your name? Daniel. Daniel. Daniel's exactly right. Uh, let me just say your point in a sec. 1,000 and the 12 goes up here, and now we've created, in a messy fashion, this guy at the bottom. Um, and now we can just delete him. Ah, but now we have a problem. What's the problem? We've got the hole in the wrong spot. Where does the hole have to be? Over on the right. I guess we could take this guy and move him over here and then bubble him back up. Ooh. Ooh. No, you don't know. You don't know anything about the relationship between this guy and this guy. So, uh, uh, yeah. Look, that's one algorithm for doing it, and it's not a bad one. There's actually lots of algorithms for deleting. Often, because um, this is, it just seems a bit fiddly, though it's probably going to involve the same number of steps as all the other, or some of the other algorithms. Here's what people often do. Uh, 12, 11, 10, and this was a guy we were pulling out. What people sometimes do to delete someone is they just uh, delete them all together and then they stick this guy up here, creating the hole exactly where we want it. And then we bubble him down to the right position. Now, now this, under this version of the algorithm, we don't know he's going all the way to the bottom. So we, but we just do the same trick. We swap him with the smaller of the two. The smaller of the two is a 10. Swap with the smaller of the two. And he's going all the way down. He is going down. But that was a coincidence in this case. And other algorithms are possible too. In fact, sh 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 by very, very careful consideration of the number of comparisons and the number of swaps you need to do inserts and deletes, particularly deletes, it's possible to tweak this so you shave off a very small number of inserts and deletes one way rather than another. And the reason people are very interested in doing that is once we have a heap and we know the operations for adding and deleting, we have instantly for free heap sort. We have an awesome sorting algorithm that just uses selection sort over and over again. Here's how heap sort works if we have a working heap. Well, you guys tell me, how does heap sort work if you've got a working heap? I won't ask the guys that just walked in. No, no, someone further back. Someone almost at the back. Is it Daniel? No, Dylan. Dylan. Oh, sorry, I've caught you unawares. I never touched them, madam. No, uh, <laughs> I, I was just wondering, if you had a working heap, how could you use it to sort, a li to sort the elements in the heap? If you don't know, that's absolutely fine. Just ask the person next to you. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> you just moved away from him when I was asking the question. I thought, you're trying to hide. Um, does anyone in the back row know the answer to this question? Yes, no, yes, no, 
Yes, no, no, yes, you do. The man with the apple, I can see. Yes, you do. You've got a heap. You're pulling, you've got to sort the numbers using the heap. The heap lets you delete an element and add elements, and it works. And you know that the smallest number is always at the top. How could you sort using that? How could you do a selection sort? Do you remember how selection sort works? Yeah. How? Um, by pulling the smallest of all the unsorted out and putting it in, and then pulling the smallest of the remaining ones out and putting it in. So how could you do that using a heap? Um, you, pull the top one out. you could pull the top one out, and he goes first. And then, okay, okay. And then you, refix the, you fix the heap up, make it a new heap. And we know fixing it up is only going to be a log n operation. And then we pull, in it, we pull the top out again. And we just iterate, pulling the top guy out of the heap until the heap's finished. And if you do it in an array and the heap's in an array, well, the top guy's always here. So, hmm. Think about it a little bit. A naive algorithm could use two arrays. But maybe starting at another end, or maybe pulling. Maybe the best thing to do would be to have a heap where the biggest numbers at the top, rather than the smallest at the top. Then you could pull the biggest out and stick it at the end here, and then regard the prefix of that as still being a heap, as your new heap. And then find the biggest one, which will be here, and stick it at the end, and and, and then sw swap that, uh, yeah. I'm sure that would give you a brilliant heap sort. Because a heap, because that's an in-place method, that's very nice. Because a heap implements a priority queue so well, and a priority queue, remember, is something that just puts the biggest or the smallest right at your fingertips at the front, at the top, and when you take it out, it just rearranges itself so the next biggest is there. Because a heap does that so very, very well, it means it's awesome for selection sort that always needs to know the biggest remaining. And so it's a natural sorting algorithm. In fact, Heap sort runs so fast and so well that it is the contender for quicksort. Quicksort in practice, you know, at least in the old days, because it had that nice register being uh, cached properly, you, the pivot just stays in the register all the time, and some locality of reference stuff as well. Um, that means things you're accessing all tend to be located near each other, which can be helpful for paging and things like that. You don't have to do lots of paging to get separate elements in. Um, Quicksort might still have the edge, but heap sort has some very nice properties. It's almost as fast as quicksort. I mean, in, in theory, you can actually make it amazingly fast, but it has a few annoying constants. The nice thing about um, quick, uh, heap sort, though, is that you notice that the insertion can never take more than log n, and a deletion can never take more than log n. And you're never going to have to insert or delete more than n things. So it's, all, it's never going to be worse than n log n. But remember, quicksort has this pathological bad case that it can sometimes be n squared. So heap sort has this sort of relying, comfortable property, although it's slightly more fiddly to code than quicksort and get right. It runs consistently and reliably very, very fast. And it's in place as well, which is like quicksort, which is very, very nice. So it's a very nice algorithm. And so a lot of research and thought has gone into improving and tweaking heaps. And w clever ways of, uh, there's various ways of going halfway down and then halfway back or racing it all the way to the bottom then selectively bubbling back up to fix your mistakes and all these various tricks that all rely on the fact that there's lots more nodes at the bottom than there are at the top. So if you do operations down the bottom that don't, that get resolved quickly and you don't have to rise very far, then most of your operations are very short and are less than log n, are, are almost constant. So by little tricks and uh, just very carefully counting comparisons and swaps, it's possible to get insert and delete operations that shave a few operations off. And the implication of that is huge because heap sorts that use that um, shave large amounts of speed off. And it's been studied so extensively that you'd be mad to ever implement heap sort yourself. You'd go and look up the latest, very, very best implementation of it. But look it up and stare at it and admire and marvel. It's not too hard to understand. It's just a heap. Look at how they've done the heap operations. Think for yourself, why did they do it that way rather than this way? What few comparisons are they shaving off? And heap sort is just very fast and nice. So does everyone understand heap sort? Does it make sense how you could do a heap sort now with a heap? Because I'm thinking maybe that's the lab question for next week, to do a heap. No, no, people don't like that? So, 
You can do it and just like share it with everyone. Yeah. Uh, it's not hard. Can I just say, I'll just say it again before you say no instantly. Shh, 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 shh. No. <laughs> to do a heap sort, you just have a heap, you, you implement a heap insert and a heap delete. And they're very, you're going to do that, we'll talk about that in the shoot, you're going to do that anyway because you need to know how to do inserts and deletes on heaps. Once you've got an insert and delete, then you've done all the work that needs to be done. You just delete from the heap one element at a time and store them successively in your array and it's sorted. So the only work is to create the heap to start with, but you've got an insert operation so you know how to do that. You just insert the elements one at a time into a heap until they're all inserted and you've got a heap. Put those two things together. <laughs> it reminds me of a very funny song by Bill Oddie. Does anyone know uh, this song about love? Shall I sing you a song? No. Okay. Sing us a song. It's very, very funny. Uh, I'll sing it to you another day. All right. Now, so now what we're going to do now is we've essentially finished all the... Uh, coding parts of the subject. If I can just do a quick recap for how the subject's gone so far. Do you remember in the first couple of weeks we just did analysis and I was telling you how pleased and proud I was that our first assignment didn't involve programming and you've done so much programming, it's time to have a break for programming. And do you remember about week or th three or four I started getting the results back from the prac exam and blood started draining from my face. And I started saying, oh, maybe we should do some more programming because I was just a bit nervous about the programming. So then I flooded you for a couple of weeks with an enormous wall of programming because the tutors and I got together and we were thinking, what's the best way of just helping them, you know, sharpen up their programming a little bit? And the general consensus from all the tutors, and it seemed a very good idea to me, I'm not blaming them, was because uh, I thought it was a brilliant idea, in fact, I love that idea, was... Um, was that we should just give you lots of programming and then just by practicing you'd improve. And certainly by practicing you have improved, though it has entirely destroyed your sleep and your ability to program or think straight or visit friends or anything like that. So I'm sorry there was that wall of work. But now, now we sort of pass that and the, the rest of the course really is just talking about analysis, talking about skepticism, to getting, trying to create in you the frame of mind that you'll always check things, you'll always ask why, you'll always say no I don't believe that when you hear something and you'll do some sort of reasonableness check or ball or park estimation um, verification that it looks plausible. And to make you think about the appropriate choice of data structures and algorithms by working out what's important and what's not, concentrating on the important things. Ignoring the, okay, that's sort of ways of thinking. So we've sort of passed all the programming part now. Now the labs from now on are fairly straightforward. There's no more intense programming. There's no more unit testing because you're doing all that in the project. You've handed in already your ADT for the project, which was the last really big bit of coding you had to do. And now you've got three weeks or something like that to code your hunter. And it's not actually a very hard coding problem. We've now got to this very pleasant point. I wish we could have got to this point sooner. And at the end of the course, we're going to do a big post-mortem with the tutors and me. And I'll get you guys to come along and the people that taught the previous courses and everyone. And anyone that wants to have a suggestion, come along and say it. We're going to work out a way that we can make sure that, you're, um, that we can get to this point earlier in the course. Because I really don't like spending time in the second course programming. Um, so we're at this lovely point now where all you're doing in your hunters is no brainy coding, it's just thinking of clever strategies. The difference between a brilliant hunter and a, just an okay hunter will not be anything to do with having leap programming skills or knowing lots about C syntax or pointers or things like that. The difference between them will be how good you are at solving the problem of thinking, what's a cunning thing for Dracula to do? What's a cunning thing for my hunter to do? How can I make sure that I'm going to catch Dracula? Uh, so, uh, so this hopefully is going to be fun. It's not going to be coding, it's just going to be fun and playing games and things like that. If your hunt uh, ADT isn't yet working, and I have heard stories that some people's ADT still have problems, that's okay. Shh, 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 shh. Because the way the assignment's set up is you can just keep submitting new ones until you get it right. Yes? Um, yeah, with that submitting it again, again, what is with, like, so we're failing their, like, first test on, like, line 50 or something, and they've got, like, a thousand lines of test, and we're going to have to wait two weeks to get through all their tests. When you say they... You mean another group in your own tutorial? I don't care if your tutorial shares tests. There's no secret about the tests. You can, what's that? You can now share and merge your tests. Don't share your ADTs, but you can share and merge your tests, sure. 
work out collective tutor. You could have done that when you specified the interface. You could have specified tests, I guess. Though you can't share code at that point. But now you can actually share the code, sure, if you want. So yeah, we want you to sort the problems out. So yeah. 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 You're not compelled to, but everyone is welcome to post their test files up and let other people look at them and fix it. Fix it up offline. Don't fix it up where marks are involved. Because don't forget, you're not competing with the people in your tute. Who are you trying to kill? Tutors. Your tutors. <laughs> your tutors. Yeah, that's right. If, if you're competing with anyone, it's people in other tutes. You want everyone in your tute to do well. You want everyone in your tute to have awesome hunters. You want everyone in the course to have awesome hunters. Then you get the most marks. Well spotted. Yep, yep. So it's a thing where everyone wins. You're not competing with each other. You're trying to cooperate. So yeah, sure, share your tests. Shh, shh, shh. But if your um, ADT isn't working, can I just encourage you to put a little bit of work in and make it work? Because once you're over that hill, you're over the, you're through the mountain, there's light, there's sunshine, there's people laughing and parties, and you're just hunting your tutors and killing them. That's all you're doing <laughs> after that. And you're not writing elaborate code. It, an elaborate hunter is not going to do well. Don't do the enormous mechanical six ton monster hunter. You just need something small and nimble that makes reasonable decisions and then slowly hone it. I think the reason the ADT, some of them aren't yet working, is this. And this happens every year that we have an assignment based on ADT design. I suspect some tutorials picked overly complex ADTs because of the wistful thinking we all have, thinking, if only I put everything I could possibly ever need in here, I might be able to write a brilliant hunter that uses it. And my prediction is, what that'll mean is if your ADT is too complex, you're not going to be able to implement it all in time. It's going to be hard to make it correct, and you're not going to have any hunter. So it's not a, in a perfect world where there's an infinite amount of time, then sure, have the world's best ADT and use that to write the world's best hunter. But in a world where you've got one week to write an ADT and then three weeks to write a hunter, and then the course is over, have a simple ADT. I'm hoping that you're, you're now, me not just saying this, but you're feeling it in your heart, that a simple bulletproof ADT that maybe doesn't give me the most powerful hunter in the whole world, but gives me a reliable and working hunter, is infinitely better than a theoretically perfect one that's never finished. This is the idea of XP. So, uh, so yeah, so the idea is basically that. Now, I'm gonna, we're going to take a little break. Then after the break, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to ask you a question about task two, because I'm just about to finish my task two. I'm a bit behind you guys. I've been writing a task two, and I've been setting myself the challenge that I can only spend 10 hours on it. Because I told you guys that 10 hours work should get a credit. So I figure 10 hours work by the lecturer who set the assignment and has had all year to think about it, that's a reasonable benchmark for a credit. <laughs> so a credit, you know, th there's no way that what I can do in 10 hours should be less than a credit, is it? So this is going to be very interesting. So I'm going to get my thing and run it. And if I, get, if I get to do it in seven, then it's clear that anyone that's got seven certainly deserves a credit. And maybe people who've got eight or nine or ten deserve a credit too. So, so uh, now what I did is I put my diary up of how I'm doing it step by step. And I stupidly, I started off well. I spent one hour coding. You can read the diary. I spent one, uh, this is for real. I'm not making the diary up. I spent one hour coding it and four hours writing tests. Oh, no, three hours writing tests. And I thought that's a good use of time, even though it was really annoying and boring and I hated writing the tests. And they're frustrating because I wanted to write the really cool part of the, um, of the uh, simulator. But it was really good because it meant that after those four hours, I had a simulator that I just knew was right and worked. And then slowly, I've been adding extra features to the simulator. I added the permutations, and then I added loop detection and so on. And each time, I've got all this suite of tests that I've written already. And it's making me very happy. But then I made a mistake. At about five and a half hours into it, I'd put the permuter on, and I'd put a basic loop detector in. I, I stopped writing tests because I was getting bored. Uh, <laughs> very hypocritical of me because I tell you to write tests all the time. And I, uh, I then got really excited by a crazy thought I had about a way of making it a little bit faster. Uh, it was to do with using a, a binary search rather than a, a sequential search to look up the operations. And I fiddled around with this and I fiddled and diddled and I, 
and I also started fooling around with my loop detection. And before I knew what I'd spent three hours, no, a bit less than three, I got up to eight hours, so wherever I am now, two and a half hours, or maybe I was at five when I started. All this time had passed when I looked up, and I'd improved my performance by 30% or something. Because I have timing thing running all the time. Whenever I run, it tells me my current performance and what, what I'm looking at getting. So I'd spent three hours out of my remaining five. It's like I went to the market with our last cow, <laughs> and I came home with something that gave me a 30% bigger bean. <laughs> So now I've got two hours staring me in the face, and I'm going to look like an idiot unless I have something reasonably good, but I'm going to have to stop in two hours' time. So my, the question I'm going to ask you after the break is, what should I do in the remaining two hours? I've only got two hours left. Panic. Not panic. No, no, do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> do nothing. <laughs> well, now the problem I've got at the moment is I haven't actually written the thing that does the brute forcing part yet. <laughs> I've, you know, I've just done the emulator part, because I, I thought I'd leave that till the end. So, but I have all these brilliant ideas too about how to make it really fast. So we'll talk about, kick the ball. We'll talk about it after the break and we'll take a vote and I'll do what you all vote on as long as you're not trying to hurt me in some cruel way. Okay, uh, so let's take a break. And then, oh, sorry, the other thing. So after the break, we'll do that. Then I'll ask if there's any questions about the project and we'll just do a general project Q&A, any questions anyone has. And then after that, I'm just gonna do um, a, a personalized consultation, a revision session where anyone that has any questions about any part of the course can ask me and I'll go over any topic that you're not understanding or have troubles with. So that's our plan, but take a break first.